So I finally got around to playing The Legend of Heroes, A Trails in the Sky. Only took me about 3 years to get to it. That ain't too bad, all things considered. I have been feeling a very a JRPG as of late. The irrational desire to micromanage equipment, stats, money, magic and everything micromanageable. The desire to get sucked into a long-winded story boasting far too many cutscenes uh, for the sake of plot and or character development. The desire to waste my brain cells on optimizing resources and damage output in a turn-based combat type of fashion. A real and true journey, if you will. And thus it was about time I wiped the dust off of a game I bought during the 2021 winter sale. This isn't even a Wii game. Hell, I don't even own the thing physically. This is, uh... Pajama Sam, baby! The Legend of Heroes, Trails in the Sky first chapter, the first entry in the gigantic RPG series that is The Legend of Heroes, a series I wasn't all too familiar with, and still truly ain't as I only learned about its existence through a fan translation of a Japanese exclusive spin-off game <laughs> that handles a completely different style of gameplay than the usual Legend of Heroes games and only has the Legend of Heroes tag for the sake of brand recognition as it really doesn't have anything to do with anything a Legend of Heroes. And nevertheless, it did open a door I didn't even know existed. A door to the journey I was looking for. The lengthiest of journeys in fact, as the key characteristic of the Trail series is its continuity across its entries. At this point in time the Trails catalog boasts a whopping 11 games, split into 4 major story arcs, starting with the trilogy of Sky. Every story arc takes place in the various kingdoms of the continent of Zamuria and were purposely written to be interconnected from the very beginning, to create one of the most ambitious storylines in video games of all time. With Neon Falcom's president Toshihiro Kondo considering it to be his life's work, stating they are about 60% through the story they wanted to tell. So, uh, yeah. I think I got the journey I wanted. And some more. A lot more. Now a continuous journey over a bazillion games is dope and all. But none of it means anything if there isn't anything to care about. Which I very much did about Nayuta no Kiseki, a masterpiece I did a very lengthy video on. Now that I've let things cool off for a year or three, I can safely conclude this game is a top 5 game I've ever played. From the difficulty to the enemy designs and gimmicks, uh, to the hack and slash RPG gameplay, to the seasonal level changes, uh, that game its an absolute 11 out of 10 journey I will never forget. And um, that is ultimately why I was scared shitless uh, to continue, or well start, any coverage of The Legend of Heroes. A game that isn't even close to similar to the rest of the games had set unrealistically high expectations for a series of games that essentially have nothing to do with it.
Uh, throw that in a blender with a passionate fanbase that will beat you up in the school backyard if you're moderately critical about a singular facial expression. And you find yourself treading on nothing but eggshells. But I do not care. I'll take on any fanbase, no matter the size. Uh-oh, there we go again with that metabots bullshit. Get the harassment report ready, because um, I'm about to say something very controversial. The Legend of Heroes, Trails in the Sky. is just as good as everybody says it is. It all starts on the outskirts of the small town of Roland, located in the blah blah kingdom. Tucked away in the forest lies the residence of the Bright family. Cassius, his daughter Estelle, and their adopted son and brother, Joshua. You drop in at a point in time where Estelle and Joshua are gullible idiots, aka citizen saviors, aka so-called bracers, in training. While Cassius is an already accomplished S-tier superhero. On what seems like a calm and peaceful evening, a letter arrives addressed to Cassius. A letter so impactful, he must leave at once for an undisclosed period of time. Grounds extremely confidential. He leaves by airship, airship goes missing. Shit is fucked. So you take on the role of Estelle and together with Joshua set out on a journey to obtain recommendations from bracer guilds all across the country in order to become licensed bracers. But more importantly, to find your dad only to stumble upon and get involved in some political conspiracy fuckery, threatening to alter the course of the entire continent. It's a classic two teens save the world from impending doom JRPG type of plot. It's nothing mind-blowingly unique, but in the context of the series, it, it really doesn't have to be. In fact, it achieves exactly what it set out to achieve. Building the world, its setting, its plot, and its characters. For 60 hours. Trails in the Sky first chapter is nothing but a build up for what's to come next, setting Neon Falcom up to hit the ground running in further entries, not having to explain a jack shit. An approach deserving of my utmost respect. It's a slow, slow burn. It is a game that truly demands your patience, understandably being a turn off for like half the people giving trails a shot. There is no high octane action, no nail biter of a story, no incredibly shocking plot twists, okay except for the ending that shit had me gasping for air. <gasps> Instead, you spend hours building up to climbing a tower so pink haired dum dum over here can take a couple of pictures, spend hours hanging out at a farm until it catches on fire, and spending an entire chapter at a school campus, culminating into taking part in a woke gender reverse play. <laughs> The 
Датчик. Is dead as hell. It's a game that takes its sweet, sweet time getting started, introducing and building characters and locations at the slowest pace known to mankind. And I fucking loved every single second of it. The astonishing amount of time and dialogue spent developing characters and painting the setting, it brings the story, the world and the squadron to life to a degree I have never experienced in a game before. The writing is fucking phenomenal. Nothing is said without care. Not a single sentence goes unused. And I know, this might seem like I'm competing in a glazing competition. But um, it's the honest truth. It is yapping. Yapping, yapping about a whole lot of nonsense, only to send you on a fetch quest and making you let out an audible. Why? Then the plot advances, slowly taking shape, and all dialogue, build up, and fetch quests suddenly connect to this major story event, in turn making you let out an audible. Yeah, okay, now th this makes sense now. It feels like the plot's being very, very slow. When it's actually teaching you about the tre importante, about its world. It's a continuous, what the fuck am I, oh yeah, I get it now, gameplay loop that is incredibly rewarding if you can master your patience, culminating into an exhilarating climax that made me want to boot up the next game. <laughs> Pretty much instantly. Had I not been juggling about 4 to 5 lengthy projects already. The writing truly elevates the game above a simple save the world JRPG, but also made me form the strongest of opinions about every single character. Uh, Gates a fucking asshole, Olivier's a fucking weirdo, and Tida is tiny. Trails in the Sky being predominantly narrative driven it means about 60 hours of building personalities uh, brick by brick resulting in a charismatic as fuck cast with a whole lot of depth. A gate being a prick is fueled by mysterious events of the past. Joshua is a cunning warrior at the age of 16. But how did he become this skilled? And where did he come from? Why is Chloe, a simple student, on a mysterious mission with a high-ranked lieutenant? Uh, they're all characters with a lot going on in the past or present. Opinions, personality traits, speech mannerisms and attitudes that really could not have been built any better if they tried. Every chapter and after most story events, characters will appear and disappear for plot related, raising more and more questions a type of reasons. The only constant being Estelle and Joshua keeping things fresh and interesting, as well as equal in build-up. Thus making for a complete and memorable cast. This woman is 21. I, um, I don't know if grown ass adults flirting with and attempting to feed a 16 year old alcohol is a choice I necessarily would have gone for, though. Yeah, I could have done without this.
And then there's the support gang, more than pulling its own weight too. With IE Nile the sick smoking, always looking for what's hot news reporter. The drunk as hell access to way too much power Duke Doonan. And the never listening bonkers a genius professor. Even the random NPC dialogue is crafted with care. And they're all commenting on the situation at hand, providing some backstory or even hinting at important plot developments. It's all great. It's all neat. It's all complete. But definitely not for everybody. It's a game for lore gobblers, for those willing and ready to be patient. It isn't straight to the point, like a good chunk of people would actually prefer. You just travel from town to town to town, from Bracer Guild to Bracer Guild, while the game slowly but surely reveals its intriguing storyline. And with a game as narrative driven as this one, you gotta be willing to listen, to enjoy. Okay, yeah, I get it now. <laughs> I'm sorry. The music and overall aesthetic could best be described as an immaculate vibe. Now I'm not talking about any revolutionary graphics or out of this world sound design. Not even for its time. But shit's honestly uh, pretty great. It's a sprite based, kinda 2D, kinda 3D, uh, kinda chibi, kinda animated and incredibly detailed artistic design that just works really well. And I mean, yeah. Uh, the pathways between towns are rather green and samey, uh, the battle effects aren't all that impressive, and the character designs aren't anything exceptional. But the overall design of it all is just hella stylish, down to the simple feat of every character having dozens of expressive character portraits and sharp and vibrant artwork in the main menu. An aspect of game design that is an art in and of itself. And this one might be one of my favorite menus of all time. Despite the game having a yet undiscussed arsenal of mechanics, the way the menu is divided into these stylish bronze headlines and transparent grey subheadings somehow makes it all feel uncluttered. And thus you'll never feel overwhelmed by any of it. On top of looking hella sophisticated, of course. A term that applies to every single aspect of its artistic design. It's truly an art to make things pop and charming uh, without actually having it feel flat. And Trills absolutely nailed that. The colors be popping and the lighting uh, be lighting. With its dimly lit caves, uh, fogged up to the max mountains and shrouded in sunset lighting, uh, shops and buildings. Uh, because of the active day and night cycle, you get to see these areas in all sorts of vibes and flavors. There are the coastal towns with stunning views from up high, the industrial vibe of size, and the elite, not for normie stupid ass citizens, a uh, grand town of Grandson. The excitement of heading over to the next area was off the charts, in due part because of the new vibe check, but also because of new opportunities to harass everyone, everywhere. Sure, each town is just a fraction of the size of the real deal, 
but you can pretty much enter any building and talk to anyone. It's honestly crazy to see this level of detail and world building in every single town and city you pass through. People will talk about their day or relevant plot points, even giving additional and new information, with their dialogue changing as the story advances. And the damn interiors go so fucking hard. The layouts very much represent the real house layout, with the kitchen, bedroom, living rooms and all that. Detailed to the last paper towel with all these assets and decorative themes that aren't once repeated. Exploring it all is a fucking blast because of how real it all feels and how much it adds to the experience and immersion. A new piece of candy to unwrap. New areas often come with new tunes as well, which might honestly be an even bigger highlight than its aesthetic. Every single track is a baller and fits the vibe of the scene or situation uh, perfectly. And even if there are quite a few repeats, the tracks are so satisfying to listen to that you never mind them rotating back in. You got your cheerful happy life uh, down vibes. A danger up ahead, the sussy tunes. And uh, shit's getting serious. Let's roll. managed to craft a battle theme that I kept humming along in the final dungeon of the game, simply because I still wasn't tired of it. The biggest achievement imaginable. It is safe to say Trails in the Sky substantially and aesthetically hit the proverbial nail on its head. He said like he was talking about an audiobook rather than a video game. <clears throat> the narrative means nothing if the gameplay doesn't complement it. But um, it does. This game is so much fun, man. God damn. Trails in the Sky is what one could call a traditional JRPG, meaning it's all about exploring and questing while plowing your way through enemies in top down isometric perspective, turn based battles. You know, one of those games with a turn order 
tactical starting grid positions to be set, and using some mana magic to destroy enemies having mana magic based elemental weaknesses and resistances. Its skeleton is truly the JRPG, as we all know it. But its flesh and nerves and other garbage metaphors uh, do in fact tickle my fancy. Trails in the Sky is brimful of the right ideas and interesting mechanics, making it so much more than just a game uh, carried by dialogue. There are the minor yet very important game design choices like making the potential encounters visible in the overworld to give you control over who to fight at what time and being able to backstab enemies to start off a preemptive strike. Or how there are treasure chests to be found everywhere, uh, thus adding a bit of oomph to running through these derivative pathways. Especially considering the fact the red variant is a high risk, high reward, get your ass whoop mega battle that is always worth attempting because of its outstanding rewards. I made a mistake! And then there's even a turbo mode to drastically speed things up for the sake of keeping your zoomer brains hooked as well. A feature I only discovered through doing a bit of research before starting the script and thus never used. I found the gameplay to be far too engaging to ever feel the need for a speed up button. Now none of this excitement is in the questing and exploration per se, as neither the story or Brazer Guild side quests go much further than a clean out area and rescue the crazy professor, beat up big spooky monster or find an ingredient for the admittedly fantastic Abrazer rank level up rewards. Nor does the preemptive strike always work out that well, as it can backfire just as hard. Because, you know, steering the long ass conga line of four party members quite frequently ends up in a random monster charging at you like. <coughs> It's near impossible to avoid, with these fuckers spacing out like they've got a contagious disease. Either making me take a lot of damage, or simply reloading my last save instead. It doesn't help either when an area is clearly meant to be conquered with a party of 3 or 4, but you're at a point in the story where you're just down to Estelle and Joshua for a bit. Thus resulting in having to fight for your life and then obtain like 5 experience. However, there's a genuine sense of control and excitement in avoiding and picking your fights, even reloading areas to respawn the same advantageous dweeb as battles. All because of being able to play around enemy strengths and weaknesses, as well as avoiding them altogether when the game's experience curve has decided you've reached the max level for an area to prevent you from over level grinding and is thus giving you one measly put of experience per battle. This isn't something that stuns the gameplay either, as the characters rotating in and out of the story will have grown to match your level upon rotating back in, all to keep them from lagging behind. Combine this with the math addiction that is the rewarding resource grind and about 1700 different interconnected gameplay mechanics that make things seem far more complicated from an outsider I'm just watching a YouTube video perspective than it truly is while playing. And you got yourselves a game you sink 60 hours into without even noticing. You got a problem. It keeps things simple yet extensive, tickling my micromanage addiction while never feeling overwhelming. <laughs> Allow me to explain. Uh. 
Okay. The gameplay is all about making choices, resource management, and growing those big, uh, fat, uh, juicy stats. It feels redundant to even mention there being a level up system, as well as equipment doing this very thing of boosting Z stats, but fuck it, we ball. It is a well designed and balanced equipment system though. The stat increases are notable, yet never overpowered, and with every new town offering new and improved pieces for the party members at that very moment. There's always something new, better and worthwhile to grind for. The remainder of your Mira aka money is spent on the classic HP, mana and temporary stat boosting potions available in your local supermarket, but more notably on an additional recipe book based potion system where you buy and receive dishes from random places to master their recipe and farm their ingredients from shops and monsters uh, to cook up. A very cool and interactive mechanic. A little side quests, if you will. That I never used. Because the perks do not outweigh the work. And buying similar effect potions in a centralized marketplace was a far better option anyway. But I uh, digress. It's a fun and balanced resource grind held together by modern economy aka enabling you to purchase just about what you need through its plot development, brazer guild side quest payouts and old equipment returns before having to file for bankruptcy uh, once again. First time I ever felt financially independent was after winning a tournament. Uh, 40 hours in. There were a couple of moments where I had skipped a side quest or two and ended up being a broke ass. But luckily you can fill up that mirror void by selling some residual. Sepif. Oh boy. Uh... Sepif, alongside meaty dish ingredients, is a different type of currency earned through whacking some glorified rats and is then used to reinvest into said a whacking. Cause uh, turn based whacking some fools is the JRPG philosophy. I'm so proud of writing this. Every character during every battle uh, for every turn has a choice to make and bars to take note of. You could go for a basic bitch attack doing basic bitch damage uh, to not waste anything nor really gain anything. Or um, you know actually a play the game. Every single character has two types of attacks to choose from, indicated by funny green and blue bar and displaying a bunch of numbers. These are also known as crafts and arts. Uh, crafts are weapon and personality based moves learned by level up, whereas arts are more akin to the usual type based mana moves you gotta replenish by stacking up on a warehouse of mana potions and sleeping in musty ass hotels. Because uh, yeah, both crafts and arts have a cost attached to them, based on usefulness. You got Joshua dual blading some noobs and Olivier letting fireball hell break loose. But also the more supportive moves where Zin is trying to hype us up. Them things have different hit ranges, spreads, damage outputs and even secondary paralysis, petrification and confusion type side effects. Look at me petrifying this sky bandit boss, thus making him a one hit KO upon impact. RNG? Be RNGing.
In essence, there's some overlap between the two, but their operational characteristics vary significantly and their usage is profoundly as situational. Crafts are on the physical, enormy side of the spectrum. It's pure colored craft currency bar being powered up by landing a hit on, or getting hit by an enemy. Most of them are centered around the character's choice of weapon, and some of them around Estelle's immature ass, uh, taunting some fools. Pay attention, bro. It's genuinely cool how well these crafts fit their weapons and personality traits you become a little too familiar with through dozens of hours of dialogue. Meanwhile, arts aren't exclusive to anybody. Anyone can learn anything. Arts are your own personalized little magic builds. You can substantialize however the hell you want. Ideally, you build to their strengths, aka their base stats. But eh, being a stubborn little dweeb is a vibe too. And thus Estelle became my healer, Olivier my hard-hitting magic warrior, and Joshua a bit of a hybrid of both. But how does one learn an art? It's... It's the fucking Sepif, okay? Based on enemy class, thou shall receive various Sepif colors upon winning a battle. These are then taken to the local Orban factory where they can be exchanged for little globals, aka quartz or open up slots to place said quartz in. Uh, different quartz and slots require different colors and amounts of Sepif, Based on IE magic type, number of unlocked slots and certain slots only allowing a certain type of quartz. Quartz are the bearers of base stat boosts and the masters of arts. Providing better stats and arts depending on level and combination of quartz equipped. And as such are the game's most interesting mechanic uh, to fuck around with. Who's gonna be the Terra a 2k healer? Who's gonna middle finger uh, the turn order? Who's gonna petrify, poison, freeze and confuse? Uh, sure, the character base limited quartz slots encourage one to build a certain way, but there is more than enough freedom to do whatever the hell you want uh, within the game's limitations of sap if drop to quartz cost and availability of quartz upgrade. Something that is, to no one's surprise, paced near perfectly. With everything available and affordable, just when you need them to be. And thus keeping things moving. It is a rather sizable pile of mechanics that opens up the playing field, and has the mechanics create new mechanics through other mechanics crossing the mechanics line. And that could have been overwhelming but instead is a pile of balance, variety, range, Not and fun. It does start things off, a little slow though. Uh, being a turn based game, my smooth brain gets the time to ponder over moves, and thus I decided to play it all on hard mode. Uh, this however meant growing pains throughout the starting section of the game, where I had to run back to the town of Roland frequently to heal on this healing pad. Because my broke ass couldn't afford healing potions, and healing pads are spaced out a lot. 
I think there's like maybe five in the entire playful. Hour five onwards, this issue, which is probably an issue because of my incompetence anyway, simply vanishes because of accessibility of and funds for uh, resources. Making room for the experience that is fighting a penguin for 40 minutes. Believe it or not, this is what peak JRPG gameplay looks like. <laughs> it really isn't exactly a fast paced game, but I don't think anybody picking up a JRPG is expecting explosive gameplay anyway. And if you somehow do, there is of course the aforementioned turbo mode that can truly put in the work. But um, I never felt was necessary. This isn't just because of the rewarding resource grind and mechanics, but also because of the enemies always being able to put up a fight. And the game keeping you modest through its experience curve to enable them to do just that. <coughs> It is uh, by design. Because of this, you are left no choice but to care about the game's inner workings. And that is obviously for the better, because it prevents it from becoming a mind-numbing uh, button measure. The enemies have all these different perks and weaknesses where they can i.e. skip the turn order or blow up upon death. But they are also weak to certain elemental magic, or are straight up immune to certain attacks. Since, you know, you cannot slice up a bunch of flies. An eggshell head over here is deflecting all magic attacks right back at you. Not to mention dog ass creatures like these magic plants and special op soldiers solely existing to piss you off by using status effects such as poison and attack delay thus combo fucking you into a miserable existence. And because of the experience curve keeping you close to their level, every turn becomes one of making choices. Always having to consider whether to prioritize the heavy hitter or the disruptor, the confuser or the delayer, and even whether to manipulate the turn order. Yep. The turn order is an interactive one, and that adds way more value than I could have ever imagined. Calculating how many hits I can realistically take while deciding on using a shorter charge lower power art or a longer charge art a banger while being able to heal said user with another art user just in time but also to make use of or snub an enemy from getting randomly generated and added to the turn order health, strength and critical hit buffs. It is one of the most interactive turn orders I have ever experienced in a JRPG. Strategically interacting with it to just about kill an enemy before it would finish me off, or grabbing some health, sepif or strength buffs to use to my advantage, ended up being such a fantastic way to go about turn-based gameplay design. Despite being turn-based, a lot of control is given to the player this way and it's control you definitely want to take when there's a hot 50% strength boost in your local area. It adds an extra dimension of when to use what uh, with who. And the best part is, even if you are unable to obtain the spot in the turn order you were looking for due to i.e. enemy speed factors weighing in, you are able to screw the rules I have money and move instantly by activating
as break. Activated by hitting 100 or 200 beat em up points, it is effectively the game's Super Saiyan mode to bail you out of a situation. And uh, easily the game's most clutch feature. Not only because of its insane damage output, but also its ability to skip the turn order. Allowing you to chain 4 bazingas uh, together. Uh, collecting 100 CP for its first form and 200 for its double powered carnage, it admittedly takes a hot minute. But uh, it's uh, special for a reason. Uh, besides, I was having such a blast juggling all these mechanics uh, that the bars filled up without me even noticing. Especially when going god mode on 10 enemies at once. Let me show you the true essence of beauty. Man, this shit is so satisfying. In fact, the entire game is. I don't usually play extensive adventures like these. Hell, I'm pretty sure this is the most lengthy single player game I have ever played and finished. 30 to 35 hours is often when I've about to have my fill. Anything after that feels like it's more of the same and is prone to losing a little bit of steam. Thus feeling like a chore to finish. But not trails in the sky. Albeit spread out over a long period of time, trails in the sky was just as exciting to boot up in its high 50 hours of game time as in its single digit hours. This, to me, is one of those special games. It's a JRPG adventure, solely intended as a 60 hour build up for what's to come, but manages to stay interesting through some of the best and most detailed story writing and character development I have ever seen. Yet it would be nothing without its engaging and balanced resource grind incredible and bulky battle system and sense of difficulty and resistance every step of the way. It does a great job at alternating very text heavy plot and character development segments with allowing you to grind and explore to the point where I never felt burnt out of one or the other. All of it culminating into the reveal of the quote unquote a real plot in the depths of this final dungeon that is such a baller fucking area, and is everything I want a grand finale to be. It's this multi-layered, ancient tomb looking dungeon containing killer machines and 15 minute treasure chest boss fight chambers around pretty much every single corner uh, for fantastic experience, a sepif and some S tier equipment. Uh, that you, and a bit of a sp -p 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 spoiler alert. that you can take on with every single character you've played as over the course of the game, since the story brings them together for one final hurrah. Making it so that you can build a team of Estelle, a Joshua, and rotate in and out whoever the fuck you want. Whenever the fuck you want. All of it feeling so incredibly tense and exciting because of this amazing we're ready to rumble a type of OST.
I'm gonna use this moment to give you a fair warning though. You better come prepared. The grand finale is a free boss battle gauntlet taking 40 minutes each. A battle gauntlet in which you aren't allowed to save in between. That I had to give up on and thus reset 2 hours of progress because of wrong team composition, magic builds and overall level. Getting punished for playing on hard mode and being unable to survive. DEATH RAGE resulting in beating the game in 60 hours, rather than the low 50s, thanks to the game forcing me to rethink my strategy. I raged, no! I mauled it, ah! I overcame. Let's go! It's a fantastic ending to a fantastic game. Through making these videos, I have truly come to know how good Neon Falcom is at making video games. They treat every single aspect of what makes a JRPG a JRPG uh, with respect, a passion and care in order to provide a complete experience that makes even a prologue type of game one of the coolest adventures I have ever played through. Maybe it's because we're living in the era of investors and unfinished bullshit games, but a game remaining disengaging for this amount of runtime. It's a special ass feeling. I truly cannot wait what Trails in the Sky second chapter has to offer after all that was established in the first chapter. Even if it might take me another three years. Look at how fucking musty this Wii is, dude. I haven't touched this in <laughs> 10 years. What the fuck?